Hey everybody, welcome to Revved Up for Sunday. We are the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Peter Walsh. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. I'm Justin Crisp. Today we have St. Peter, St. Peter's Day at St. Mark's. Today we have Jesus, not the professional fisherman, telling the professional fisherman what to do, a big catch, and then the professional fisherman say, get away from me. Here's the text. Luke 5, verses 1 to 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Hmm. Hmm. Likely story. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say that is I just think it's amazing that, you know, they would, they would bring in such a haul and then walk away. You know, they brought their boats to shore and walked away. And I mean, that's why it's told that way, I think, is because it's so um, hyperbolic, you know, that it's so, uh, con- the conversion has happened, you know, so it's a kind of illustration of conversion. But I, I don't really mean likely story. I just mean it's, it's told in such a kind of caricature-like way. Mm. I've always um, puzzled over it, mm. you know, but... Puzzled over their, the portion where they walk away so quickly. Yeah, I mean, drop apart? everything and, you know, who is left to clean up the mess and sell the fish and put them, you know, <laughs> to market. And I don't know, I'm a practical-minded mm. reader. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's Zebedee. I think it's James and John's dad. That's the answer oh, to that. Oh, right, okay. Right. So Zebedee, yeah, Zebedee's yeah, going yeah. yeah. Zebedee to take care I, of the I fish. Now good. that I can relate to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As the father of sons, is that the way yeah, it would work in your household? That's the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, you know, I, I think that Elizabeth is right that it is. Um, it probably is uh, hyperbolic, but the, what, the, what the text hyperbole is trying to, as you said, communicate and depict is just the power of this conversion. It's a 180 for these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and regardless of whether they actually historically walked off right after they got back to shore or they happened to go home and, you know, pack their, you know, pack their underwear and their socks and their suitcase or something like that, it doesn't really matter that much to me because the fact is they did leave their families <laughs> to follow this mm-hmm. rando who's wandering around the, you know, wandering around this, you know, in the middle of nowhere, teaching people, preaching to people, healing people, etc. So even if they didn't just like launch right then, mm-hmm. it's still more of a 180 degree turn than I've ever made in my entire <laughs> life. And I've made some like 90 degree turns, mm. but I've never made a 180 like this. Um, I'll say that when I, what I love about this story is I do love the suddenness Mm-hmm. of the conversion. I do love that they just drop everything and go because mm-hmm. I feel that enthusiasm myself at particular times in my life. I never had the courage to make that 180 degree turn. I do make like a, 
uh, 90 is really being quite generous. It's more like 30 <laughs> or 25 or something. You sort of started out in the right direction. Yeah, thanks. But, you know, <laughs> I do feel that kind of uprush of, oh, this guy, Jesus, there's something about him. I just want to chase him. And that's what they do. They, they, they proceed to chase him for the next couple of years. Um, so I'm always taken with that. But what I think are the most important words in this passage are so many fish mm-hmm. because of mm-hmm. what it says about God. Um, hey, God mm-hmm. here, um, well, let, me, let me start that sentence over, sorry. One of the commentators I read said that this story of conversion is kind of like a, it's, it, it's, like, it, um, it's like it condenses the conversions of, of thousands of people mm-hmm. during Jesus' public ministry. And these conversions are happening in the midst, in the context of the mighty works of God and Jesus' teaching. And so you've got both here. Jesus' is teaching and you have this mighty act of God that they set down their nets in the deep water. And it comes back and it's so many fish. But the reason why I love the so many fish bit is because it shows us God doesn't skimp. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thomas Aquinas said that God is maxime liberalis or maximally free-handed. Uh, maximally liberal, not in the sense that, you know, he's like FDR or anything like that, but uh, maximally liberal as in it just gives and gives and gives and gives and gives some more, maximally free-handed. And so everything that God does is a little bit over the top. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the nets are bursting, I think, tells us a lot about God's over-the-topness. It's one of my favorite things about the Christian depiction of God, actually, is Mm -hmm. just how Mm -hmm. over-the-top God is. He reminds me of... um, uh, one of our predecessors, Elizabeth, uh, in the associate rector position here at St. Mark's was Martha Klein Larson. Yeah. And one of Pastor Martha's constant refrains was God's abundance, God's abundance, God's abundance. And she was always trying to get me to like, she's like, Justin, you're in a logic of scarcity, man. You got to get into the logic of abundance. God is abundant. And uh, that, that's what the story is trying to, mm-hmm. I think that's part of what the story is trying to tell us. Yeah. yeah. And so many of the parables go on to keep that. That going, that Absolutely. Well, what about the what about the two bathtubs of wine from two weeks, <laughs> right yeah. from two weeks ago? ago right? They, yeah. was, it's not just a couple way, of glasses. Yeah, way 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 more wine than they could drink. There's yeah. so many fish, the boats are sinking. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And then what's the ra- what's the role of the second boat? Take two boats. <laughs> the role of the second boat is to catch is to take the fish mm-hmm. that uh, that they couldn't get into one boat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. fascinating. I, I I think it's you know your your opening commentary. I think is funny because you actually did the same thing. <laughs> you just didn't do, you just didn't do it in condensed form. Mm. How did you go from uh, you know travel writer in Paris to sitting here? Right, your your mm. your turn was mm-hmm. a one eighty. It just maybe a little bit a yeah. little bit longer. Right. Sometimes this turn is a little bit like you ever. I don't. Even, I mean, some of the highways where they say they have the little. Uh, turn for the cop and it says no U-turn mm-hmm. and every once in a while you see someone doing it you're like oh wow dude these guys making this U-turn well this is that this is that kind of U-turn people but, banging a UA as we say in Connecticut yeah you know I, I mean I think that the thing about this is that it is um, uh, okay so this is the, we have the crowd pressing at him right but to hear the word of God so this is not a healing this mm-hmm. is a teaching moment and it's the word talking about the word and so they're coming to the teaching um, and then then we so it's word it's teaching and holiness mm. that's that's a, this is the conversion this is isaiah 6 1 to 8 right this is isaiah uh the uh, priest in the temple caught up mm-hmm. caught up in the holy temple and uh his isaiah's conversion is peter's conversion and what do they all they both say hey i'm a sinful guy mm-hmm. right in isaiah we have mm-hmm. i'm a sinful man who lives among sinful people mm-hmm. and we get the burning of the coal on isaiah's lips mm-hmm. and yeah. here we get yeah. peter's same reaction to holiness which is oh my gosh anybody mm-hmm. who's been in touch with the holiness there's only two possible reactions one is you fall on your face and the other <laughs> is you fly high mm-hmm. there's nothing in between there's no coming in touch with the holiness and going mm-hmm. <laughs> you know i mean you're either down you go or up you go there's nothing anywhere in between. Peter mm-hmm. goes down and says, go away from me, mm-hmm. just like Isaiah. I'm a sinful man. And then where Isaiah is forgiven with the cherubim and the coal, Jesus, Jesus' forgiveness is don't be afraid. Don't right. be afraid. Mm-hmm. That's Jesus' forgiveness. Sin has made him. Sin makes him afraid of holiness. So for me, uh, and I would say, without knowing everything about your story, I know it's not a lot about both of your stories, but your conversion, as long as it was, had to do with both the teaching of Jesus and, and coming in touch with the holiness of Jesus. And so when we come in touch with the holiness of the living Christ, that's when 
bang, go down on your knees, you go, mm-hmm. and you say, man, I am a sinful man or woman, or uh, how we might, whatever pronoun we might use here, and the desire to know our lowliness, and, and as St. Benedict would say, you know, the more you know your lowliness, the higher you go, it's the inverted mm-hmm. ladder, and, and the desire to serve. That's, that's what mm-hmm. comes out of this. And Jesus' call is to service. You know, that's where you're the fishers of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot to say about that, but um, maybe next time yeah. around here. Well, I'd like to point, point out that this is Luke chapter 5 already, and that Jesus actually has a reputation. He's famous. Mm. He's well-liked in Galilee, except for yeah. in Nazareth. And he's, got, he's famous, and he's charismatic, and he's been healing, and he's been teaching. He's been doing stuff. And... Um, so I think that in a way, they know who they're talking to, and Peter's like, "Oh, here he's coming for us," you know, and I'm I'm not good enough for this guy. But then when he comes in the close contact, the one on one with with Jesus, he realizes Jesus can see him, you know. I mean, he can, and he's picking him. He's not he's not uh, taking applications, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, Jesus isn't screening or anything. He's just he just goes. <laughs> no and get background him. check here. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and and it's Same sort of church. random, so random choices along the, the seaside. So, it's interesting that Jesus, I guess he does say it right to Simon. So he, it seems like he's pegged him from afar. But, um, you know, he's not alone, and he comes with others who don't really get named in this gospel. But anyway, all that to say that I think uh, it, Jesus is more compelling at this point in Luke than he was in Mark or Matthew. Mm. Um, in John, he has that whole great exchange with, I, I think, um, Bartholomew and just, I don't know, all these different characters, Andrew. Mm-hmm. But, um, Who is, I might just say, where is Andrew here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, because yeah. James yeah. and John, sons of Debbie, and clearly Andrew and Peter are in the business together, too. So I just, yeah. Right. 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 Another topic. But anyway, you know, and Peter is a sinful man. We all are sinful people, and Jesus doesn't really care, and they don't stop being you know, sinful throughout the gospel. Jesus just keeps getting them back into the following mode and mm-hmm. teaching them along the way. It's kind of like yeah. learn as you go discipleship. So I love that. You know, that's the thing yeah. I love the most is that Jesus, he doesn't even compute yeah. that sentence, you know. Yeah. I'm a sinful man. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, well, yeah, you know. I mean, I got my St. Peter here, everybody. I know the podcast, people can't see my St. Peter. We pointed out earlier that it was sun ble- ble- bleached, and of course, <laughs> Peter as a fisherman would have been sun bleached. But one of the, the great stories that uh, Thomas Keating, the great contemplative, has in his teachings is the evolution of St. Peter as a disciple. Mm-hmm. That is a fantastic teaching. The third, the, the person talked about most in the, in the New Testament, obviously, is Jesus, then Paul, and then Peter. And so... Uh, Thomas Keating lays mm. exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. How does mm-hmm. how does Saint Peter become a disciple? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think here? I. So I'm really I I'm stewing in my head. Um, stewing is probably too generous. It's more cogitating. Like, you're, I, you're cog- got a PhD. You uh, that's, don't stew. That's still, you're that's still too generous. I mean, it's kind of like I put a stuffed animal inside of a inside of a dryer, and then it's just kind of bouncing around. Um, <laughs> But it's the I'm, I'm taken with uh, Peter. Your suggestion that do not be afraid is the equivalent of the coal coming to um, coming to Isaiah's mouth, um, mm-hmm. being put to be put to his mouth by the by the angel. Uh, so that do not be afraid is a kind of is a kind of absolution, uh, mm-hmm. is a kind of declaration of forgiveness, is a kind of declaration of I don't care. That's not the most important thing to me. You're going. I commissioned oh, yeah. you anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, the do not be afraid as God's response to our sinfulness. I'm really taken with that mm-hmm. because I think that um, hmm. you know one of the most common questions that. I used to get when we were doing lectionary Bible studies here at St. Mark's, um, you know, mostly before the pandemic, uh, you know, because sometimes, uh, you know, during the adult forum time here at St. Mark's, which was between the 8 o'clock and the 10 o'clock services, if we didn't have an adult forum program, we would do lectionary Bible study, and it was fun because it often turned into Stump the Priest, where, uh, you know, everybody just kind of sat around and they're like, well, what about this, and what about this, and what about this? Um, and the question I... I think the question I got more than anything during those conversations was, what does the fear of God mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a very popular Old Testament phrase. It's a, a translation of a particular Hebrew phrase. And I used to say that it meant something like awe. Uh, you know, it, it meant mm-hmm. to, um, 
uh, you know, I, uh, one theologian says, um, in the presence of the beautiful, the whole man trembles. Uh, gender not inclusive there. Sorry about that. In the in the presence of in the presence of God, the whole human person trembles. And um, you can tremble in different ways, though. You can tremble because you're terrified. Right? You're just scared out of your mind. And I think there is a part of us, like Simon, at least there's a part of me, like Simon, I'm like, God is just too hot to handle. <laughs> and too hot to handle because I am not worthy of being in the presence of God. And I think that the part of the spiritual journey is moving away from that kind of trembling, being converted from that kind of trembling to the kind of trembling of desire and love and the kind of mm-hmm. trembling that you might feel when you are in the, ah, like when you're in the presence of a lover or of your, of your, of your well, for me, my spouse, you know, uh, it's, um, it's a kind of trembling that is in awe of the person in, in awe of their beauty, but it's not fearful. You see what I mean? So, you know, uh, you know, you're talking about the holy. I'm reminded of Rudolf Otto, who defined the holy or the sacred mm-hmm. as a mysterium tremendum et fascinans. A, a tr- <laughs> and it's, this, um, it's, a, it's a mystery which uh, captures us. It's alluring, and it causes us to tremble. Um, and so it's this... Um, it's, it's not that the Christian life is going from trembling to not trembling or trembling to, um, you know, being calm. It's like it's a conversion from a, from, a, um, from a kind of trembling which is anxious to a kind of trembling which is loving. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I always think of um, uh, George Herbert's um, uh, poem, Love Three, in which uh, he's depicting, he says, you know, Jesus is inviting him to come to a table and he says no no no, i'm unworthy i can't come to your table um and then jesus talks him into it and then he then george herbert is like well but uh, let me serve you i'm not worthy I, no 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 I, let me at least serve you your dinner right if i'm going to come to your table i'll i'll wait on you and he and then jesus says no you must sit and taste my eat and so i did sit and eat is how it's not the exact words but it's something mm-hmm. like the exact words and it's this like one of the things that George Herbert thinks you have to conquer has to be conquered in you by grace spiritually is your own sense of your unworthiness to be in the presence of Christ. Mm-hmm. That's actually a part of the conversion story here. The do not be afraid is crucial to Simon's conversion because it's this movement from thinking you're unworthy to be in the presence of God to feeling welcomed by God, mm-hmm. served by God actually, that releases you to be able to serve others releases you from all of that anxiety you've been carrying around because of your sin, et cetera. That was unbelievable. <laughs> well, uh, sometimes, sometimes letting the thing uh, roll around in the, yeah, in the dryer works. in your dryer. I love your, your image. That was a great. Thanks for bringing us to the bounces of your dryer. That was really incredible. Okay, now I've got another one for you here. Uh, if you think that that, um, how about this, uh, the portion that we read this uh, with, uh, you know, with Old Testament eyes here. One of my commentators I love to always read in the scriptures with Old Testament eyes. Uh, put out into the deep water. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about deep water. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. so that's a whole other I thing. I thought Elizabeth had something to say about uh, this. <laughs> you, you know, why we, well, what do we think of deep water? And just mm-hmm. to say that uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, a deep water is not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Deep water is the place of sea monsters. It's the, it's the place of the... The, uh, the the wild of chaos, mm-hmm. and uh, the beginning of the book of Genesis is the the waters right. are the waters are out of control, and and the mm-hmm. word of God brings order out of that mm-hmm. chaos of the water here, and and now here we have the incarnate word of God, uh, who has been said to Simon here, um, you know, go out and go fishing. And he said, it says here, put out into the deep water and let your nets down. And Simon said, Master, we've worked all night and have caught nothing, uh, yet if you say so. So, again, this is one of these translations, which is like a Dees, Dose, and Demmer translation. <laughs> it doesn't actually get to what it's talking about here. It says, at your word, so now is what it really means. So now we have the word of God being the word, saying go into the depths, put your nets mm-hmm. into right. the depths. And so what's in the depths also 
is is this is this is Galilee of the Gentiles, right? This is Gentile territory, mm -hmm. even though Nazareth is a Jewish town. Mm -hmm. uh, and he say, and and the Gentiles are considered in the deep waters too in certain of the scriptures, mm -hmm. uh, beyond the holiness of God. And he's saying, put your nets down into the chaos of the Gentile fish. I'm I'm, I'm really pushing mm -hmm. you on this one here, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, into good. the depths of the and let your nets down, and mm -hmm. then the catch is overwhelming. It's what is it? But it's mm -hmm. it's it's the the Gentile fish of the chaos yeah. and and then what do we do what are we supposed to do as as people who fall in the wake of saint peter uh but to put our nets into the depths of people's right. internal chaos to bring the word mm -hmm. into the depths of their internal chaos that's awesome that opens up the whole passage into a different reading yes, you know even when they get to calling their friends to help i mean what do you even do with the chaos that's that you've caught and mm. Yeah. You know, and you can't ever do that alone, and Jesus would never intend for them to haul it in the, alone. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's a beautiful reading. I love that. I was, oh. No, no, that could continue. be like our church. Continue. No, no, just yeah. write what you're saying. I mean, right. think about think about the, yeah. the 1,600 people that that's we're trying to keep tracking right, up yeah. and how, yeah. you know, their depths are completely overwhelming for each of us, mm -hmm. and so we have a whole whole mm -hmm. church to take care of all this because yeah, we can't. Yeah, can't, burdens. You can't, you can't bear it all. It's just too much. Right. But anyway, sorry right. for interrupting. Well, yeah, I was yeah, yeah. taken with what Justin said, too, um, you know, that Peter, the fear and awe, experience and mm -hmm. i think in 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 a way it's exactly where jesus wants people to go is <laughs> self-awareness of their mm -hmm. i don't like the word sinful or i mean it's an important word but i i feel like it's also just i don't bring anything i don't have anything to give you mm -hmm. or offer to this mm -hmm. work yeah. you know nice. and yeah. i think yeah. Peter's like i'm just a fisherman you know what am i gonna do in your I'm just with you yeah. and yeah. it's that beginner's mind you know it's like if you can be self-aware then you're ready to get on the road mm -hmm. or, or you can continue on the road and someone who says oh i can i could do that you know i'm 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 ready to mm -hmm. be one of jesus peep, right hand man you know mm -hmm. and i think that there's something to that idea that when you have mm -hmm. that trembling awe that you were talking about justin that is like this mountaintop experience that few really are aware they have or they have it but you can't have it every day right you know but what you can have every day well you you need that like paul had it falling yeah. on the road blind and peter's having it now and um i can't say that i did do it 180 on a dime like that but i had a you know i, I no i'm got saying, the boat going in the other yeah. direction but i wasn't like a well it's a whole different story <laughs> but i but i think that you know if if we're fortunate enough to have that awe trembling encounter at some point where it really you where you're really changed and you go in a different direction and and, and you can peg it to a time and date and mm -hmm. you know call that your conversion that's one way but i also think that there's this gradual unveiling of yep, your sure. eyes yeah. where you can be like yeah. oh you know i'm i'm getting this or whatever but each day one has to come back to this idea that Mm. You know, this isn't me at work. It's God at work in me, yeah. and I'm yeah. I'm getting back on the road and following. Totally. So I think that, and that awe and trembling. I think we can put ourselves in a position to um, taste that mm. from time to time, or you know, if you have a practice of meditation or prayer, or whatever yep. it is, or even service, especially service to others. Um, you know, you have these moments where like even the smallest thing put, puts brings you to your knees and mm. you're just like wow that was incredible or, or you look back on something and realize yeah you were really in awe and um mm -hmm. it's an important experience and i i do think peter's afraid but also i think it's exactly where what jesus was looking for yeah 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 totally um i'm completely with you on conversion i would say that i i have personally um i have Mm, how much self-disclosure do you do, right? <laughs> uh, I have trembled in the presence of God, but I will say it never happened. Um, there's, not a, there's not a single date on the calendar I can point to. Well, that was the day I trembled in the presence of God, mm -hmm. right? It was actually one of the reasons why I, I, um, I became an Episcopalian is because of the theology that Anglicans have of conversion can sometimes take place like Paul and the Damascus Road, and you're 
bam, knocked down. You can say on February 5th, mm -hmm. 1989, I had this, you know, this Damascus Road experience. That was when it changed. And people do, mm -hmm. uh, members of the parish, <laughs> have had these experiences. Mm -hmm. My experience, and this was something I found was also honored by Anglicanism, was of this like a slow burn of the gradual, the gradual conversion from one trembling to another. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm completely with you there. Uh, something I'm really taken with, Peter, that, about your interpretation of the chaos um, is that we are, um, well, just for one thing, uh, there have been two moments in this podcast so far when my shoulders have gone down for those of you who are watching at home and that's like I do I mean my shoulders they just, they just like creep up over the course of the day and by the end of the day I'm like, I'm like this <laughs> but you know uh, so I know I'm really I know that the spirit is like relaxing me and I'm like <sighs> and there are two times I did that the first was with do not be afraid because that is just balm to my soul because I grew up as a little kid and I was terrified of a lot of things including terrified of God uh, and I no longer am and what an incredible <laughs> thank you Lord uh, that's an incredible <laughs> blessing for me so but I just you know Shoulders went down. The other was when you were talking about the deep water, Peter, and comparing it to, equating it with the waters of chaos. And then my, my shoulders also went down because I, um, I had a campus chaplain at the University of Tennessee, John Tiro. I love John. John was very important to me. When I was discerning my call to the priesthood, he's a Lutheran pastor and a great country singer songwriter. He wrote a lot of songs for like Rascal Flatts. Yeah, very, very impressive, very impressive. guy. Uh, but John said there were two kinds of people in the world. And I'm sure he didn't make it up. John made up very few things himself, uh, except for his songs. Uh, you know, anyway, he, John was great at like aggregating spiritual wisdom and passing it on. So I don't know who came up with this, but there are two kinds of people in the world, John said. Order Muppets and Chaos Muppets. And... <laughs> It, I mean, it's the easiest personality test to ever take, right? You already know inside of your head who all of your friends are, right? I am such an order Muppet, and I'm not going to go around and tell you what these two are. <laughs> uh, but I am an order Muppet. I cannot stand chaos. And, um, but there's a lot of chaos in the world. There's a lot of chaos in my life. There's a lot of chaos in our church. There's a lot of chaos in the priesthood. And the word that chaos is the site of God's creative activity. Mm -hmm. Chaos is where God likes to create. Chaos is where you put down your nets and up come the fish. Mm -hmm. And it's just a good word to me because I am so uncomfortable with it. But to know that that's really where the miracle is happening does make my shoulders go down. I'm like, you know what? Maybe the chaos is okay. And these two are like, <laughs> thanks be to God. He's had that realization. Uh, you know, if only it would transfer to a staff meeting. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to say about your interpretation is that um, I think we're practicing a... Um, an ancient form of biblical exegesis. So for the medievals, there were many different meanings to the same scriptural text, right? And you can condense them into there's a literal meaning which they, by which they meant historical meaning, and then there's an allegorical meaning. And so the allegorical meaning that you just had about the mission to the Gentiles, which does, it just throws the whole passage into new relief, they would say is compatible with the historical reading too. So they thought that God was basically writing history in a symbolic way mm -hmm. so that the things which Jesus walked around and did carried additional spiritual meanings that they were unpacking through the centuries. And um, just to, um, to take us back to the historical event just one more time, to the historical reading or the literal reading just one more time, the fact that this particular mighty act of God is that these people have been out fishing, they didn't catch anything, which would have been economically disadvantageous, to put it very poetically, right? It's not good, because this is the way they make their living. And the miracle that's worked here is to get them some fish so that they can go make some money. I think that also says something about God. Uh -huh. <laughs> because uh, the um, in the ancient world in which these texts are circulating, not Everybody thought that the good life or the life which was really worth human be worthy of human beings humanity involved material flourishing at all um, so the mm -hmm. ancient Greeks thought that what it meant to be good and to have a good life was just to be good and if you were good if you were, if i was mm -hmm. it's exactly his character if i'm the best Justin that Justin can ever be. I'm living a good life. It doesn't matter if I end up dead in the ditch. And there's something about the ancient Jewish and Christian inheritance that says actually it matters if you end up dead in the ditch. That's actually not a good life. Yes, you need to be good. Yes, that's a part of it. Yes, 
the you know the acorn needs to become a tree you need to become a, you know who god intended you to be but also your life needs to go well you don't just live it well it needs to go well and here is god making this one moment anyway in these fishers lives go well beautiful hmm. what if it doesn't go well See, I think that in the life of the world to come, everybody's life is made to go well. And that's the reason why I have such a, that's the reason why I cling to the life of the world to come in such realistic ways. It's because so many people do end up dead in ditches. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the God of, the God, um, the God of this Jewish Christian inheritance is just not satisfied with that ending. And so has to rewrite the ending by extending the story. That would, that would be my response. That's yeah, people do yeah. end up in ditches. We need a whole podcast on this. Yes, we totally do. <laughs> but wow, that's an interesting perspective. So, I like that. Yeah, we're going to end this with you. Thank you for hanging in so long. Really appreciate it. Who would have guessed there was so much in this passage? <laughs> yeah. uh, we began that we began before you came on with saying we didn't have much to say. <laughs> uh, and we're going to turn this off now, but we're just going to talk for the next day and a half about this. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll give you the greatest right. hits out of the next day and a half. We're really grateful to you for, for tuning in uh, and for sticking with us. Uh, the living word of God does change our lives. And whether or not it's a big U or a small uh, U-turn, uh, that word is alive in our lives. And uh, we hope that uh, that word is alive in your life now. We also hope that you'll like and subscribe and be in touch with us if there's anything that uh, this, this word that we've batted around today in historical and allegorical ways is helpful to you. So uh, peace be with you. Thank you to you two. Man, peace. unbelievable you two. God bless you. Take care. Oh, 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 oh,